I'm Claire Cushman, and we're here at the Supreme Court Historical Society with Professor Kevin McMahon. He is a political science professor at Trinity College in Connecticut, and the Society has awarded him the Erwin Griswold Prize. The last time we awarded this prize was in 2011 to Mel Yurofsky for his biography of Louis Brandeis. It's an award that we give out on an occasional basis when a book on Supreme Court history merits particular distinction. Congratulations, Professor McMahon. We're Thank very you. happy to have you here tonight, and I know you're going on to the Supreme Court to give a lecture. So for those who um, are not able to attend the lecture tonight, I'm going to ask Professor McMahon a few questions about his book. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to receive the award, and it's nice to have a conversation with you about the book. So tell me, when Nixon was first elected president, what was his attitude about the Supreme Court? Well, during the campaign, the Supreme Court was really a centerpiece of the conversation of the campaign. The, the conversation of the campaign. Um, at the time, crime was rising, and many people believed it was because of the decisions of the Warren Court. So both Richard Nixon and George Wallace uh, criticized the court for their decisions. Going in, Nixon also knew he would have an opportunity to replace the Supreme Court justice because Earl Warren had retired from the court in the summer of 1968. So it was clear that the court was going to change. Many of liberal, um, many liberal critics thought Nixon would shift it radically to the right, um, but how he would actually shift the court was a bit unclear when he first became president. So how many vacancies was Nixon able to fill? Nixon really has an opportunity, almost unprecedented in the history of the, the court, to replace four justices in the space of two and a half years, early in his presidency. And he's lucky, because he has those vacancies, he's lucky for another reason, because three of those four are liberals of the first order, Earl Warren, Hugo Black, and Abe Fortas. He ultimately appoints Warren Berger, uh, to replace Earl Warren as Chief Justice. He makes that appointment in May of 1969. He then tries to fill Abe Fortas' seat with two Southerners. Both of those are rejected by the, by the Senate. Uh, about a year later, he, um, he appoints, he nominates Harry Blackman, and, and the Senate confirms Harry Blackman. So that's his second justice. And then in the fall of 1971, he appoints Harry, uh, sorry, Lewis Powell, and William Rehnquist, and those are his third and fourth justices. So what was Nixon looking for in a Supreme Court nominee? What were his criteria for selection? I think it's fair to say that there are three things that he's, he's really looking for. He wants somebody who's qualified for the court. He wants somebody who's reliably conservative. And I argue most significantly, he wants somebody who, who offers some political symbolism. Uh, to go along with the nomination to the court. The, the problem is that the pool of candidates is somewhat limited and that he typically has to compromise at least on one of those items uh, when he's making a selection. So walk me through one of those appointment sure. selections and tell me how those three elements came into play. Yeah, so for example, in the fall of 1971, when he has these two vacancies on the court, um, Justice Justices Black and Harlan resigned very close to each other. Um, Nixon wants to appoint a Southerner. Certainly one of them will be a Southerner. He had, a, he had tried to appoint two Southerners earlier and was unsuccessful. And then the second, he, he considers appointing a woman. He considers appointing a Catholic. And he also considers appointing a second Southerner. Ultimately, he makes a decision to appoint a Southerner and a woman. However, when their names are released in sort of like a, a trial balloon, the reaction to their names is quite negative. And ultimately, uh, because of that reaction, he decides not to, not to appoint those two. He goes back to the drawing board. He selects Lewis Powell from Virginia, who's his Southerner, uh, highly respected. Uh, whether or not he's, he's uh, a committed conservative is some question. Uh, that's certainly a question out there. And he chooses William Rehnquist, who's certainly uh, known to be uh, a solid conservative, very intelligent, 
um, but offers no political symbolism. So is it fair to say that Nixon placed politics over ideology when he was making these selections? I think it's fair to say that when it came to um, making these appointments, po both of those items are there, right? Politics and ideology. But he's not, when he looks at ideology, he does not, uh, he's not looking for somebody who's a, uh, a purist, if you will, a conservative purist, right? They should, they should be uh, considered conservative, but they don't need to be uh, thoroughly conservative. Uh, he leans more in terms of the political symbolism as long as they uh, bring with them some sense of conservatism. So in doing your research for this book, did anything surprise you about Nixon or this um, appointment process? Sure. I mean, you know, when you listen to the Nixon tapes, there are a lot of surprises, right, in terms of what the conversations are about and some of the language that's used. Um, I think more globally, the surprise was that I, I understood that there would be a political strategy in terms of the selections, but I was, I was a little taken aback or a little surprised by, the, by the, 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 the manner in which Nixon was often the leading person in these conversations talking about political strategy, talking about how these opportunities for changing the court could not only be an opportunity to change constitutional doctrine, but to change politics as well. And, and his sort of command of, of the, the political environment was, was somewhat, was somewhat um, surprising. So in the end, was Nixon happy with the Supreme Court that he got by the end of his tenure as president? Certainly, um, he can point to certain decisions, I'm sure, that he was, he was not pleased with. But after he leaves the presidency, he, he always expresses um, successful, that he believes that his, his picks were a success. He believes they were certainly conservative. He never offers any criticism, that I, that certainly that I ran across, where he said, in a, in a way that's similar to Eisenhower, when Eisenhower was leaving the presidency, he was asked the question, have you made any mistakes as president? And, he, and Eisenhower allegedly said, yes, two, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. Uh, apparently in reference to William Brennan and to Earl Warren. Nixon never offers that type of comment. He, he gives every sense that he's pleased with the decisions that he made. And is there, is there one particular justice that you think that Nixon was most proud of appointing? Well, I think the, Nick, the, the, appoint, the appointment, the justice that becomes most significant um, historically is certain, certainly William Rehnquist. That William Rehnquist is there for a very long time he obviously is Nixon's associate justice. He, he's uh, elevated to chief by, by um, Ronald Reagan. So the fact that he, he didn't offer any political symbolism that Nixon of, often wanted, um, he nevertheless appointed them, and that he became really a leading force in shaping constitutional doctrine over the course of his 33 years on the court. So who was advising Nixon about the appointment process for the Supreme Court? Yeah, the, the most important person is, um, is Attorney General Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren Berger is also an advisor after he gets on the court. Mm -hmm. um, William Rehnquist himself mm -hmm. uh, in the Justice Department mm -hmm. plays a role. And then within the White House circle, Ehrlichman, John Ehrlichman, uh, is, is part of the conversation. Those are probably the, the key individuals. But he does bounce off ideas from, from several, you know, I, th I believe there was a conversation with Ronald Reagan at one point of uh, potential nominees. Now, whether or not that was a serious one or just, you know, something to talk about is a different question. But those, those certainly in the 1971 appointments and, and 1971 significant because in 1969 appointments, the, the, his conversations in the Oval Office have not begun. The taping system is not in yet, right? So we don't have those conversations. We have the conversations from 71. So at least in 1971, those were the key individuals. So one last question, Professor McMahon. For Supreme Court buffs, what is in this book that they might not expect to find? Well, I think there's a lot there that they wouldn't expect to find, but um, there's certainly interesting behind-the-scene conversations about who to choose to appoint to the court 
And there's also a component that tends to get less attention, and that's how the Justice Department goes about choosing the cases it's going to focus on and, and those that it's going to focus on less. So, for, for example, there's extension, dis extensive discussions about Roe versus Wade, the reaction to Roe versus Wade, how to pursue it, what types of issues that the Nixon Justice Department should focus on to sort of shape constitutional doctrine for the next generation. Okay, thank you. So the book is Nixon's Court by Kevin McMahon. It's published by University of Chicago Press. Thank you so much for stopping by the Society. Good thank luck you. with your lecture tonight. Who's presenting? Justice Billy is, is introducing it me is introducing. tonight. introducing. Yes. Wonderful. Thank Congratulations you. again on winning the Griswold Prize. Thank you very much.